So this event, this landslide and tsunami that occurred here in Tonfjord is a huge event. It's one of the largest tsunamis that we have ever seen in modern history. So we're here in Icy Bay in Alaska in Tonfjord. And so at the, at the end of Tonfjord, we had a very large landslide, large enough to generate a wave that was probably about 300 feet high when it was first generated. That wave produced run-up values in excess of 600 feet right near the source and waves as large as 200 feet, 100 feet throughout the fjord. So, um, we're here looking at the tsunami, we're here recording tsunami evidence, we're trying to understand how the tsunami evolved throughout the fjord, how it evolved outside the fjord, how it was able to move sediments, how it was able to damage trees, how it was able to change the landscape. Um, this is a very, very remote setting, like we're, we're a long ways from any sort, sort of support and we have pretty limited budget as well for uh, such a large team. On this side of the park, the Yakutat District, it's part of the, the largest coastal mountain range in the world. In front of me is Mount St. Elias, at a little over 18,000 feet tall, the second highest peak in the U.S. and it comes straight up from sea level in just 11 miles, I believe. Uh, 11 or 12 miles from sea level up to that height. There's a huge amount of tectonics going on and very, so and the tectonics are responsible sort of for some of the huge mountains like St. Elias back here, um, which has just insane relief. See, we're at sea level here and it's 18,000 feet up and that's only like 10 miles away. So the tectonics are responsible for that, uh, but we're also high latitude, so you have a lot of glaciation on these high mountains, and those glaciers are also retreating and have been for quite some time, and then they're retreating faster because of more modern things going on. And that retreat is also causing uh, uplift to occur too. So it's just an in incredibly dynamic place. one of the largest tsunamis that we have ever seen in modern history. What it allows us to do, it allows us to study tsunamis on a scale that we've never done before. And as soon as you bump up the scale, you start to look at huge things, you get a lot more information. You can see effects that in other tsunamis are small or not noticeable, but here they're huge just because everything is blown up, everything is bigger. And so when you can do that, you get so much more information. You understand details about the flow. With that information, we go back and we try to apply it 
to our models and to our physical understanding and we try to try to back out what the water probably did once we can do that we have some confidence that these models are reproducing these really complex physics that we see in tsunamis and we have some confidence moving forward that we can use these types of tsunami models to predict events like this in the future and then not just facing There have been, haven't been a whole lot of studies using this kind of high resolution data to look at landslide deposits underwater. So that will be of interest just in and of itself. Um, but also this, this entire event was discovered um, from a desk in New York by Colin Stark, one of the collaborators on this project, by taking advantage of all the, the seismic network around here. Once we have a better handle on the topography of the landslide in the water, we can start to tease apart uh, what is, where, where the landslide is, where it isn't, to try to come up with a, a total volume for the landslide, which will help constrain his model of landslide detection from, the, from seismic data. But then also we will, some of our other colleagues will be running tsunami propagation models through the fjord here to try to get a better handle on how the physics of these operate. And to do that, they need good topographic data. I was in Japan at the time, uh, about to have a baby, and almost exactly the, the due date of the baby, my colleague Yuran Ekstrom in New York, where I'm normally based, where we have a, a system running to detect earthquakes, he spotted a, a likely landslide earthquake. Uh, this is using a system of global, what's called the Global Seismographic Network. The event, most of the seismic events in the St. Elias area are tectonic in origin because it, it's an incredibly tectonically active area. Um, but just occasionally, when you look at the seismic signature, you can see, ah, this is not a tectonic source, this is a landslide source. The, the shape of the waveforms are different. And then subsequently we got uh, a worldview GOI image, which is sort of 50 centimeter resolution, beautiful image, one of the most beautiful images I've ever seen. Um, the light quality was fantastic. And you could see the spectacular and truly huge landslide. We realized that it, it was the west flank of the head of the fjord and sure enough the landslide had entered the water. Some of it had dumped directly onto the front of the glacier. It was a very unusual combination and given the nature of the seismic analysis we are able to glean some very important information from the, the seismic data including, most importantly, the, the force involved, which in this case came out to be about 100, 200 giga newtons, which to put that in real terms, turns out to be about 100 to 200 million tons of metric tons of mass that had, must have entered the water at an acceleration of one to two meters per second squared. So what I'm really interested in is all the material that ends up in the fjord. Where is it coming from? So what processes are driving it? So one individual event, does that equal a hundred years of regular, the glacier is slowly moving back and it's adding more material and the, as it's pulling back, all of these mountains that you see here and those gullies and rills, those are adding, slowly adding material into the fjord. So we're not necessarily teasing the sediment out. We're looking at, okay, now we know between May and August, how much landslide material is added in. And from what we looked at in May to back in time before the tsunami and landslide happened, how much material was added in there. You can use the sediments and the size of the sediments and how they're arranged to start to estimate the speed of the water and the depth of the water, which helps understand how the dynamics of how the flow evolved as the tsunami came ashore. And something that's interesting for this setting is there's just so many sediments. There's Normally you have a, a vegetated surface that um, the tsunami might erode some of it, but it doesn't erode everywhere that it goes in. 
so it can pick up sand. Usually a tsunami will pick up sand from the beach and maybe just next to the beach, and then it'll spend the rest of the time on land slowing down and depositing that sediment. But here, this is fascinating. The tsunami seems to have just scoured down through the soil, so the soil here is only decades old, so it's not very strong, and it, um, the roots of the vegetation wasn't very good at holding the sediment in place, so the tsunami picked up and moved sediment kept picking it from the, the ground surface the entire way almost that it that it went in. So that's a it's a new way of thinking about how tsunamis are moving sediment. We'll follow it. Uh, but there are also several points that are, you know, would significantly expand what we have there, including probably the highest run of it that access is at best sketchy. No problem. Thank you. I'm gonna uh Slide down here for a sec, Bjorn. You know, we're extremely fortunate to have been um, supported by by NSF here to come so quickly after the event. If we had waited, you know, till next year or a couple of years from now, much of the evidence of this tsunami would be gone, and we would never be able to understand what we. You know, some of the, the, we wouldn't be able to do some of the science that we can do because we we're here so soon. Um, so that's, that's of tremendous value. Of societal importance, absolutely. You know, we, we're in, you know, we're in a, a spectacular fjord in Southeast Alaska. And while there aren't typically people right where we are in, in any large numbers, there are many, many fjords like this in Southeast Alaska where there are large numbers of people um, there are some communities around, but also in the summertime, like right now, there are cruise ships. So in Glacier Bay, for example, where cruise ships that hold thousands, a few thousand people on them go up and down the bay every day, you know, should one of these large landslides come down into the water and trigger a tsunami, the, the devastation could be quite horrific. So absolutely, you know, this, the, the combination of being able to get here so quickly with, with a whole suite of very sophisticated instruments, um, we're hoping really provides um, provides us with the means to, to make some, some big changes, uh, big advances in, in tsunami science. Surveys, I've looked at a number of tsunamis in the past 15 years or so. Uh, and since those first ones, you realize first how important it is to be in the field. When you're in the field, you, you see things that are so complex and they, they require you to think about the processes that happened around you. It requires you to dig into the physics of probably what happened and you learn so much more. So it is so important to come out in the field and see these things. There's no, there's no replacement for seeing one of these events. Yeah, it, it, in some sense, it's almost like the perfect experiment. Find the remotest area in North America where you can generate uh, a tsunami, landslide tsunami, run the experiment and make a host of observations from that and then learn from that, apply it to building some sense of what will happen when a similar event, which will inevitably happen, in a much more populated area, um, and we'll, you know, it's sort of an ideal sort of uh, natural field scale gigantic experiment. And so that engineering connection becomes really important because you have to be able to convert this this basic scientific understanding, which which is really important. It's the most important piece of this puzzle. It's understanding these things that we've never really seen before. But taking that scientific information, putting it through the engineering interpretation, and then being able to provide a product to policymakers, to local emergency managers, that allows them to make decisions when events occurs, this is the end goal. There's one or two other ones we could point at that are maybe bigger, but this is pretty dramatic. Um, and it's happening in an environment which is very, very similar to other environments that the National Park Service manages, um, where there are lots of people who are going in those areas, like in Glacier Bay National Park and Kenai Fjords. Um, it's a very similar environment. It's coastal, glaciers are retreating, and you're having debuttressing of hill slopes. Potentially there's some kind of permafrost thaw going, Montine on permafrost thaw going on. Um, and if you have very large landslides hitting bodies of water, you can have tsunamis that could affect people. And so 
nobody died in this one, nobody got hurt, nobody really even knew about it until we saw the satellite photos. But we should be taking the opportunity to learn from the experience where nobody got hurt so that we can maybe be a little bit more proactive about the things we're 